as a kind of tutorial, but not really tutorial, way to discuss this kind of paradigm that has been developed here, I mean, I in Splash, um, there was, there is one workshop called Agere that tried to put actors, agents into the loop of the mainstream programming. But actors are ready, agents are far, because uh, they were, but we believe that are worth to be investigated. So, so the idea is that you see that there will be multiple speakers because, because uh, we are going to tackle different aspects in a unique way. So my name is Alessandro Ricci from uh, University of Bologna. And then Rem Collier for, from UCD, Ken Hendrix from Q Delft, and Juju Meyer from Utrecht. And the idea is that the objective of, of this talk um, is Not respond. Oh, anyway. So, provide you an overview about the key concept of agent oriented programming, which is so trying to put it in relationship with object oriented programming and then to understand why, what, what's, what's the point about having this kind of agent oriented programming. And in the first part, so we will see it as a more as a continuation from uh, uh, objects and actors. And then in the second part, we will see also. It's used as a tool, practical concept, in order to deal with complex system AI, so programming intelligent systems, which is quite what uh, have been the main, it is the main, the main uh, purpose in, in other community of agent-oriented programming. And then, um, but in the first, first part of the talk, we, we, of this splash um, uh, talk, we will provide concept, but the good part is, Mm, that we will have also a practical session. So we would like to show you uh, how uh, some practice with um, platform languages, agent-oriented programming languages, considering the state-of-the-art one. So the one that in the community could be considered the most, I mean, uh, among the most uh, robust. So we will see JSON, Astra, and, and, and Go. So they applied the paper uh, of the talk, sorry. So there will be this first part in which I will do some brief introduction about the, co the main concept behind agent-oriented programming, and then Juju will go into agent-oriented programming languages. So showing also issues, aspects, details about the language level. Then in the second part, we will go into the practice and application. So first we will see with RAM some basic agent-oriented programming from me on the fly using JSON and Astra and the, the, our tools, uh, hours of the community, I mean. And then in the second part with Kuhn, we will see how to program cognitive and intelligence system with goal. And also s with some, goal is a, uh, an agent oriented programming languages, and uh, also with uh, uh, applications, complex, uh, complex applications. So feel free to interrupt us every time. So it's meant to be much more a dialogue than just uh, a monologue. So uh, I think that we are all happy if we are getting this kind of interaction, right? OK, so let's, par let's start with the, the concept about agent-oriented programming. I mean, the region of agent-oriented programming traces back to the work of Soham uh, from Stanford in 90, at the end of 1980. Maybe there was also other works before. And in a paper that is uh, referenced here is seeing agent-oriented programming. By the way, AOP, I know that. Uh, this is aspect-oriented programming for the mainstream community, but typically we, we call it also agent-oriented programming. So sometimes you will see AOP and this, of course, agent-oriented programming in our case. So it's context-aware, uh, context uh, um, term. As a programming paradigm based on cognitive and societal view of computation, uh, about computation. So pro providing these two level of uh, um, um, kind of framing computation. Oh, sorry. I think that I will do in this way because it's not working. So, um, and this idea grown up, grows up in the, in the context of uh, AI context. So uh, that paper was in uh, uh, artificial intelligence journal, but the idea is that in that paper, Sean was suggesting the fact that that concept, this concept, could be good for programming and for software engineering. So putting it in relationship with object-oriented programming. And in a way, we see that it's 
a similar case of actors, for instance, uh, in which, I mean, the, basic, the, the, the original uh, idea about actors by Hewitt was devised in a context with which was more distributed AI. But finally, it became a reference context and co concept and model in concurrent programming, distributed programming, and so on. So, um, so the idea of Sean's uh, view is about agent-oriented programming as a specialization of ob object-oriented uh, programming in which you consider the fact that um, if we think about object-oriented programming in the papers, I mean, I'm referring to the paper of, of Sean, say, if object-oriented programming, you think about computational system made, of, made up of modules able to communicate each other, that, uh, uh, and that have uh, individual ways of ending incoming messages. As soon as, soon as you go through agent-to-end programming, you specialize this framework discussing what's fixing the state, how you model, you represent the state of these modules. And it was proposing um, a way to represent this, uh, a cognitive way to represent the, the state, uh, considering more mental state. And also the communication, a cognitive way to consider a uh, way in which these modules uh, communicate, not just simple message passing, but speech acts. And we will see what does it mean. Uh, so there is this idea of a cognitive and society, societal view of um, computation. Um, so and the, in the Sean's model, there is the idea that the modules, so which should be compared to objects, in our case the agent are the module, that have a mental state which is composed by beliefs that are information about the world, about themselves, about one another, and also other um, uh, uh, characteristics such as capabilities, choices. So um, Shams was saying computation consists about, is about these agents that are interacting, informing, requesting, offering, accepting, competing, assisting each other. So raising the level of abstraction about how do you see message passing in a sense. And this is, was the idea by, by, um, by Soham. Um, so the point that I would like to put together, uh, I mean to put today be, be, um, be, um, besides Soham, is to reflect about the origin of paradigm. So to frame out what, what's the origin of agent orientation. I mean, if we talk about imperative programming, well, uh, what's the source of inspiration of imperative programming, typically, that we want to talk to people? I, I think more hardware or for normal machines, you know, because if you think about um, what, what uh, how the imperative languages have been designed, the main way, the main inspiration maybe was hardware. If we think about functional programming, Functional programming is not hardware. I guess that's math or something like that. I'm not a guru of functional programming, but I see the beauty of having a. And if we say object-oriented programming, what's the source of inspiration of object-oriented programming? So I'm in the, in the community. As, as far as I learned by Alan Kay or by the people, is the world, the world itself. So we are moving up. To the ra the, we are raising the level of abstraction. We are more toward the, the domain. So the point is, if we think about agent-oriented programming, what's the source of inspiration? And here, the source of inspiration uh, is um, humans and the human world. So the idea is that, um, what does it mean? That actually, in order to model some aspects of systems, such as autonomous components, flexible components, components that interact with each other, a main source of inspiration are humans. So setting up models that are catch things that we think that could be useful, that we observe in, in, in at the human level, and we understand that they could be useful in order to devise the proper level of abstraction to program these kind of systems. And this, why it could be useful? Is it useful for something? Well, the idea is that to raise the level of abstraction to deal with complexity. So, modeling autonomous and interacting ent entities. So, dealing with aspects that are complex, such as concurrency, such as asynchronous, uncoupled interaction, 
in a proper, at, the, at the proper level of abstraction. It's not only about exchanging messages. This is the message. Um, and modeling also open dynamic systems. So, you, of course, agents are entities that are able to flexible uh, uh, adapt to the uh, dynamic environment. So, thi and I, th these are aspects that are not important only in AI, I guess, context, but also in software engineering today, in program modern programming. And also, uh, what we see, we can see also, to having a way, to, and this is, I think, very important today, to devising a path so that as soon as I start programming some entity, I would like to have a path in order to inject some AI aspects. So today, there is a strong, I think that everyone is seeing some path between programming some system and programming some system, putting some AI. And in order to, for instance, automate things, to make, so, but in a, not only at the mechanism level, so just having a, a way to frame this kind of path. Uh, um, and so, for instance, planning, and so, for instance, learning, and so on. So, the idea is that in, the, so was 1990, something like that. In 20 years, what happened? But, well, uh, the, the idea was developed mainly in the context of agent and multi-agent system research community. And over there, it comes out to have agent-oriented software engineering, agent-oriented programming languages, and so on. And by the way, here, I'm not one of the main leader of this, but here we have uh, the other speakers are the main, I mean, the guys that make this kind of history. And, but the term agents, you see, appeared in many contexts, for instance, AI context. So the Norvis book uh, about AI is take the, the concept of agents as a uh, concept in order to explain and to discuss all the te techniques, but it is a main concept of, so in the context of simulation and so on. So w what was the point that we tried to explore the value of this uh, abstraction, including also the multi-agent. When I say agent-oriented programming to me, Implicitly, it's like to say object-oriented programming. It's not about programming a system with one object. Typically, you are going to devise a system with multiple agents that are interacting. So how this concept, we've started to explore with the JRE, the value of this kind of abstraction also for programming, concurrent and distributed systems and, and so on. So back to the original uh, aim of, of, of SOAM. And, uh, um, through 20 years, many languages have been developed in the community. So this is just uh, a way. So for Agent Zero was, yeah, was by Shawam, the Agent Zero, right, guys? Yeah. And then there was Plaque, and then Agent Speak in 96, and then Jade, even, even if it's not really a language, but three APL, double APL, and so JSON, and then until the last. So many languages have been developed in the community. By the way, really not known in the mainstream commu programming community. That was one of the points that we tried to put also in Amos. Say, if we say that our languages are so beautiful, let's go in Splash. And maybe they have an opinion about programming languages. Um, but So this was also the point to go out. And here you say the main, some of the faces that changes the, the history in that context. So Junju, for instance, Ram, and then G G Kern with Goal, and then there are many, many others, starting from um, Shoham. Okay, and so what's, what's are the basic concept about um, um, so um, agent-oriented programming? So we start having this kind of abstraction, the agents. Agent abstraction that first difference, first characterization, you design an agent by specifying some kind of task, explicit task or goal that the agent has to achieve. So the agent is an autonomous entity. Uh, let's, let's consider an active entity that it's not just a process or just a thread or just something like an actor. It, you start devising the fact that you, in the model, in the computational model, you would like to specify that the fact that this entity has a goal, has a task to, to achieve. And in order to achieve this task, typically, the agent has to live, is situated in some environment. And in this environment, is going, the environment could be a logical environment, for instance, set of objects or the physical environment, for instance, the room where the robot is moving. And the idea is that, so the agent has to have a weight in order to act and perceive the uh, environment, 
and also, of course, to interact with other agents by means of message passing, but it is not only message pa asynchronous message passing. It's decorated with some predefined semantics. We talk about speech acts, and we will go more detail after. Okay, so let's consider agents versus objects. What's the main difference? Uh, if I have to take one main difference between agents and objects. Well, if in, a, in agent, if in object, we, we found this encapsulation about state and behavior, <coughs> objects provi agents provide also encapsulation of a control flow. So the notion of autonomous at the most low level point of view, we can think about autonomy as the fact that have, I encapsulate a control flow in order to achieve some goal. So I'm not encapsulating only a state and behavior, but the control of that behavior. This is pretty much the same of actors, in a sense. But here it comes the second main point. You know, I'm, these are uh, kind of key points besides this, the specific agent model. There are many agent models, many agent architecture. I think that I try to focus on the main things that are besides, in spite of the specific. So if actors or and objects in the Allen case, for instance, view, are reactive entity. You do something because you receive the message. And if you, do, if you want to represent some entity that keep on doing something with actors or, or, obje or objects, what should you do? Suppose that you have an object and you want to represent some um, entity that continuously do something. Well, uh, either you call yourself or you send the message to yourself. So in my opinion, when you realize a component that needs to send a message to itself in order to go on. The level of abstraction is not so, such a good. So the idea is, is it possible to capture the idea of uh, having a proactive entity, uh, an entity that at the model level has a task to do? This is agents. Agents are able to put together reactivity because they are able to react to events from the environment or from other uh, uh, agents, and proactivity because of we specify a specific goal or th we have a, a, a way to have a task-oriented or goal-oriented design. Um, uh, is it clear or something? If you have questions, you know, I'm not, please do, uh, please ask. Uh, I think a, a, a simple, concrete example using a simple program in an agent-oriented language that we walk through. Yeah. Uh, uh, once we see a simple example, I think a lot of what these terms mean will suddenly right. become clear. Right, right now, they're all kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a space of possible meaning. Right, right. In fact, uh, th uh, now that will be in, in the next part. I'm, I'm going to close it soon. But I think that even if there is not here, we have not the language. Think about whatever kind of actor language, so E, if you have to do something in E. I mean, I, I love actors. I mean, Ajer is about actors. After 40 years, finally, we have that actors are going to become, in a way, mainstream after 40 <coughs> years. And then, uh, but it's really strange to see that so the, um, a matter of taste, if really, uh, given the semantics of actors, if I have to realize a proactive entity with an actor, it's not so conceptually easy to me. Because a car will say, well, look, do you send a message to yourself? Or what, uh, what's the problem? That's good. That's good the way to do it. So it means that you have, it, it, it's a matter of maybe also of taste of what does it mean design. So something that uh, in the language, when we, we go in touch in the language, we'll see it. Anyway, so we have this. And by the way, yeah, just a note about the notion of the environment. The environment could be what could be used as, it, it's a first class entity in the model in the sense that agents are situated in some environment that could be also shared. And in fact, the, the idea of doing actions and having percepts is because of there is an environment. But it could be used also as a first class abstraction in order to model those parts of the, your program that you don't want to model as an autonomous entities. So for instance, if you assume an actor wave to model everything, uh, everything should be an actor. Here they see the idea is that you could have also a way to model something of your program that is not an agent. So just putting passive entities or not autonomous entities. So wrapping what is actually also the uh, other components developed in, in, other, in other paradigm, so to say. 
Um, yeah. Um, so um, back to the cognitive view. There were in the literature, uh, there were developed several models. One of the most, maybe the model that have been most implemented by uh, languages, agent-oriented programming languages, is the BDI model. So the belief, desire, intention model. This is a model that has been devised uh, in literature in order to understand human behavior, so not for, I mean, programming agents, but have been taken as a reference by the research in, in agent-oriented programming community in order to devise a concrete computational architecture or compu concrete uh, computational model. So about these, agents speak and three APL, double APL that will be discussed in the next uh, part will be, are based on this BDI. So the idea is that basically the concept that you have, the first class concept that you have to program an agent when you deal with the BDIs are beliefs and beliefs are about um, uh, the information that you have about your words. So, um, so information about the observable state of the environment, about the other agent, about your itself. So it's a way to model the internal state of the agents with differently from objects. You have a way to model also what the agent know, thinks to know about the external environment that could be changed by the, the external environment. But anyway, it could be compared to the object's private state. And then we have um, the goals, uh, an explicit representation of what task to accomplish, not how, because how is given by the plan. So pl you, you program the agent, programming the behavior in terms of plans, in a sense, and the plans are the proceed encapsulate. It's like, in a sense, like methods, but in a different way, a procedural knowledge about how to achieve the plans, uh, to, the, uh, to achieve the task and to achieve the goals. But yeah, of course, details, as soon as you will see the language, you will, uh, it will be possible to uh, be more detailed about this. And also events that are related to the fact that agents are capable to, uh, I mean, you have the possibility to represent relevant events for, for an agent to be perceive and to react to. For instance, a plan failure, goal failure, a changing in the condition of the environment, and so on. And the most, here, uh, there, is, uh, there is a point that will be developed, I guess, also by Jean Jules, which is very, very important for defining how the, the, the semantics of agents. So agents are this kind of autonomous component. How do they work? They are based on this kind of execution cycle, which is also called reasoning cycle or control loop, that is continuously doing without blocking, never blocking. An agent is never blocked. A kind of sense, deliberate, or plan and act. That is, I'm going to, at each cycle, at each clock, just to say a tick, I'm going to update my information about the environment. I'm going to select what to do next, and then and maybe select, you know, if I have a new goal to achieve the plan to, to instantiate of whatever, and then I'm going to select one action to do. And at each cycle, typically, you do only one action. This is, could be compared to, yeah, the, the, the actor or object message loop. So every, you can represent the behavior of actors, the dynamics of the actors in this way, in a sense. So waiting for a message. Given the message that you have, because you have a queue, for instance, you select the handle and that you execute atomically the handle because of the macro step semantics or the run to completion semantics. Uh, this is, by the way, it's the semantics of also mo every modern, I mean, piece of software that you run because web, web app are based on JavaScript and uh, are based on this cycle. Android application are based on this cycle. Even loops are everywhere today. Communication even were there 30 years ago, something like that. So you know, in a, in a different way. But so, what's the differences between these? So the idea is that here you have the run to completion sem uh, semantics. It means that when you execute an handler, you cannot be interrupted, and you have this is an important property in order to have no race condition, in order to avoid deadlocks and so on. But here you block if you don't have messages waiting for the next message to, to, be, to appear. In here, it's still a loop, but you, don't, you never block. So the idea is that you never block also because you interleave the execution of plan. So here, the idea is that the plan is not just an handler. 
It's just a, a pattern of actions that are executed. And the execution of the individual actor is atomic. But you can interleave also multiple plans at the same time. It's like to say that people can do several things at the same time. Of course, this could create some problem. Uh, not low level, not race condition, not deadlock, because even if I'm block, I have a plan that which is blocked, it's waiting for something, the agent still keeps reacting. So it can still perceive whatever kind of things that he wants to observe. So this loop is never blocked. But also this, I guess, that will be more clear to see when we, we see the, 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 the concrete language is also the platform. And finally, so the idea of the societal view about uh, that was Sean was referring, so speech acts. So speech acts is something that is on top of asynchronous message passing. So it is based on the speech app theory, and the idea is that you describe the communication decorating also with some semantics according to some agent communication language. So there are these kind of, uh, the, some agent communication languages have been devised, such as FIPA ACL and K KQML, in which you have a fixed number of performatives, <laughs> because recognizing the fact that it, whatever kind of, mm, kind of communication that you want to have, it could be about informing about something, asking about thanks, uh, something, achieve some goal, and whatever. So you have a fixed set of performatives that you, have, you can use in order to t uh, put some semantics in. Performative, it means, as, as far as I know, the idea is that you can use um, the a an action in order to do actions also. Because you, know, you can ask another agent to do some action, or not only to inform about something. So it's about the theory about Cyril, I guess. And so let me just try to rephrase and make sure I'm understanding. So performative would be, if I'm making a request of you yeah. Oh, it's a kind of a locutionary react. Yeah, it's a way to tag, I guess, the name of this kind of. Um, um, b b I guess that the, the term performative is sp specifically about the kind of communica um, communication act that you can do. These are called performative in the theory of speech act. So all of them are performative. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. It's a way to classify the old possible way to interact. And so, b because of there is an implicit semantics, if you request you, me something, I know if you did, if you did a, a request that I'm supposed to ask, uh, to, t to inform you about something. Okay. Or something like that. Or if you ask me to achieve some goal, since I have a notion about goal, I can refuse or do something uh, about achieving a goal. So, I mean, there be, there's been a huge amount of discussion about the use, usefulness about this, also in the agent community, not usefulness. Finally, but I guess that's also you guys working with the, you use few of these performatives, not all the performatives, but some, also the J guys are, are using, I guess. But anyway, the idea is that, to me, as a, I mean, more from the programming level, it was interesting to see that this way to attach also some kind of common sem not semantics of the content of the message, but about the attitude of the, m of the, of the uh, communication. So to complete my, my part, this lightweight introduction. So agent orientation, so I, I have been developed uh, in the uh, agent and multi-agent system community in terms of agent-oriented uh, software engineering, for instance. So talking about methodologies, patterns, software architectures, frameworks, and these, these research were based, I mean, were, were using as much as possible also non-agent programming languages. For instance, one of the most, I mean, used uh, platform uh, to build multi-agent system is Jade, which is implemented in Java. A different, a, a little bit more strong approach is try to seek for agent-oriented programming languages. So the idea is, of, is f f from that community is that you want to have agent-oriented first-class abstraction even at the programming language level. Not only in terms of architecture, software architecture, but also at the language level. And th th there are many, many discussions also inside the community say, well, no, you don't need languages. But, uh, and instead, I mean, uh, this is an important point for agent-oriented programming. 
So, said this, if you have you questions before going to Jean Jules part, which is more about um, languages. So you start. Yep. Yeah. yeah. feel completely wired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, good afternoon everybody. So I'm uh, to show uh, you a, a bit of the uh, programming languages. Actually, I will focus a bit on what uh, Alessandro already called kind of cognitive uh, languages uh, based on the BDI concept. Um, so let's start. So this is the, um, the overview of my part. I talk you uh, a bit about what I uh, consider to be uh, cognitive agents and the BDI programming uh, paradigm. Well, don't be alarmed if I talk about BDI, believe these art and intentions. I don't really believe that these, these uh, artifacts get uh, believe these art and intentions in, in the way we do. It would be if I would be an, a, a, a supporter of strong AI, but I a uh, supporter of weak AI. These are metaphors, and they are useful metaphors, and I will show you uh, also some of the applications of it. Um, so as an example, I use uh, triple APL, double APL, and uh, <laughs> so you see what uh, uh, Alessandro called the execution cycle, or the reasoning cycle is here called the deliberation cycle. And uh, I'll show you that, and then I go to uh, do some uh, applications. Not showing you any code as yet, <laughs> leaving that for other people. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually my uh, understanding of uh, intelligent agents. So um, there is some autonomy involved. And uh, it's always the question how this is done. And um, in, in the cognitive agent setting, we are thinking of looking at uh, mental states, uh, beliefs, desires, and intentions, and some even, even, even wilder things like uh, emotions. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll show you this, this as well. And uh, so this is, these are languages which have informational attitudes, of course. There, 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 there's a lot of information going going uh, uh, around, but also motivational attitudes. So some things like goals and plans and things are very important in these languages. So, yeah, this is also well. Uh, I go to this briefly because these are the the, the things that are mentioned in any book on uh, agent uh, technology. So these agents are situated, they are really acting in an uh, environment. They are reactive, able to react uh, adequately also to unexpected situations. Uh, they are proactive, I think that is one of the most important things that distinguishes agents from other uh, programming uh, uh, paradigms and uh, 
so they are setting and pursuing its own uh, their own goal. And also, of course, we will also see that it's they are social in a multi-agent setting, to able to cooperate with other agents. And there, the speech acts that Alessandro uh, mentioned come come back again. Okay, so. Yeah, I have also a slide uh, about uh, agent first and object, but uh, on, a, on a slightly different uh, level. If you, could, you could also say that objects have some uh, autonomy, for instance, they have their own methods and private things and things like that. But here it, it goes a bit farther. And I heard someone uh, that was Hans Weigand, who was uh, at the Tilburg University, he said agents are more subjects in the in the in the linguistic sentence, the subject of a of a sentence, then they are objects in, in the linguistic center, uh, center, uh, sense. And these are these were mottos that are uh, were going around in the in the beginning of uh, alien technology. So I think like objects do it for free, and uh, agents do it for money. And another one, agents are objects with an attitude, and this more or less pertains to this attitude of beliefs, desires, and intentions. This is a very well-known picture from the beginning of the, uh, of the agent uh, uh, paradigm, the BDI architecture. Well, actually, it, it, it doesn't say that much, but it at least says that there is a sensor input and an action output. There is an interpreter doing things, juggling around with beliefs, with goals, and sometimes goals and desires are the same, sometimes not, but uh, let's treat them as the same here. And intentions, and also with the help of a plan library. I have shown you how this works uh, more concretely later on. So this is also a very early picture. So this is uh, how this works. So you get sensor input. And that means that uh, the, the agent has to believe his, uh, uh, revise his uh, beliefs because, uh, well, some may be outdated or even wrong. And then you get uh, this, the, uh, these will fed into the belief base. And on the other hand, we have all kinds of desires which generate options. And you see a filter that takes uh, the beliefs and uh, the desires and also the previous intentions to put a new intention there. And from this intention, which you may already see, which is something like a plan, we get actions. So typically what you see in concrete languages, these intentions become plans, uh, sequences of actions, and then some actions, a part of the plan is uh, performed. And you see, I uh, have to mention Rao and Georgiev, who were one of the first who think, uh, thought about these things. And they already had this abstract VDI interpreted 25 years ago. And here you see more or less this, uh, this in, in pseudocode, what is uh, on the picture uh, uh, on the previous slide. So you have an initialization, and then you generate options and you deliberate the options well in some sense uh, that will be clear later on when i talk about the language and then you update your intentions from the selected options and then you execute it well, not completely but at least part of it and then you get new external uh, events and you drop the successful attitude and you drop the impossible attitude as far as you can make out that they are impossible at that point. <coughs> because that is, of course, very, very difficult sometimes. Okay, and then uh, well, this goes on as, uh, as uh, Alessandro <laughs> already mentioned. So now I go, uh, go a bit more into the detail. So these cognitive languages are typically rule-based. So that is uh, very abstractly, they, they contain a set of uh, rules. Uh, which on the, on the left-hand side you, you describe a mental state uh, and then you describe on the right-hand side what actions should be done. So for instance, 
you have a VDI state which says what the beliefs of the agent are, what the desires of the agent are, what the intention of the agent are, and then you can, if, if this is all fulfilled, then you can do these actions. And sometimes you have also multiple of these rules that can apply at the same time. I, I will say what, what, uh, what to do with that later. And sometimes also what I call VDI plus. So that means other things, uh, for instance, what we uh, did was also adding emotions and things like that. And we can also look at uh, a plan state, which is a, a couple of actions, and then we can replace that by other actions. Why would you do that? Well, it's kind of plan revision. We will see that later on. So, uh, so triple APL and double APL, well, triple APL was more or less defined by Kuhn. <laughs> Uh, and uh, later he went on <laughs> with Gaul, and uh, at uh, our place maybe the Stalin came and <coughs> turned it into double APL, uh, which is a programming language with for programming these mental PDI concepts. So you want, and that is exactly what uh, Alessandro was telling you, you want to really not only use this in an architecture, but you want to really use these concepts in the language. And it is a actually quite an interesting language. It's a mixture of imperative and logic programming uh, aspects uh, are there. And so let's look at how a triple APL or a double APL agent looks like. Well, this is the more evolved version where we have a complex mental state incorporating the beliefs about the agent's environment, the declarative goals, which says representing the states of affairs to be achieved. So a kind of formula, formula describing the situation that you want. And then plan, uh, describing action to achieve the goals. So these are actions. And then you have a set of mechanisms working on the mental state. So you have a mechanism to execute plans, which means that you're controlling the environment. And you have uh, rules to, uh, to, to, to make decisions and to uh, do what we call practical reasoning. So we, uh, in, in this language, we have two of them. Oh. Yeah, I see still something. Okay. Protest from the, from the beamer. Okay, so this kind of things, well, this is the syntax. Uh, I, I wrote uh, the arrow the other way around of the earlier slide. So what you see is this is a so-called plan generation rule. That means if you know what your goal is and you know you have a certain belief about the world, then this plan is a, can be adopted for achieving that goal. And this is what I call plan revision. So I have a plan A that is uh, scheduled in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the plan base. And I have a certain belief. Then I can replace this plan by something else, a plan B. So this is a kind of code, uh, 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 code revision. Of course, very restricted because, well, uh, it could also, could, could only be done if this belief is true. And then to round it uh, up, um, we have a set of capabilities which are the basic actions of the, uh, of the agent. For instance, uh, in a robot setting, it's, uh, these are typ typical uh, move things and uh, grip or up and things like that. So we have this uh, control architecture. Actually, I, I spared you this, but we gave a complete uh, uh, formal semantics based on uh, structured uh, operational semantics of uh, Hennessy and Plotkin, Plotkin from the 80s. But there's a lot of Greek, and I, I'm not sure that you are waiting for that. So I, I skipped that. Um, the overall thing is, 
you have two phases. You have a rule application phase, which is uh, plan generation and updating. And you have an execution phase, which is a belief updating by plan and execution. So this is in more, more in detail. So here you see the, the role in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this language. So first, this, uh, this blue part is uh, the plan generation part. So you, 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 you try to look at plan generation rules that first match the goals, because that is what you want. You want to reach the goal. And then you remove plan generation rules with atoms in the head that exist in the belief base, because these are already there. Th you believe them already, so you don't have to achieve them uh, anymore. Then you find uh, plan generation rules that matches, match the belief, and then select the plan generation rule to apply, and then you apply. And then the same for plan revision. So you find plan revision rules that matches the plans, then you look from these which are matching the beliefs, and then uh, you select one to apply to a plan, and then you apply the revision to the plan. And then you have the red part, the, the plan execution part, find plans to execute, select the plan to execute, execute the plan. So that is the, the deliberation cycle, more or less in full in this, in this kind of language. So maybe made it uh, a bit more practical, some, uh, some of the, 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 tr the transition from triple APO to double APO. So for instance, in that's more the most important thing perhaps, in triple APO we could apply plan revision rules whenever we wanted. But here it's only in the case of failure, so don't, don't fix what isn't broken. And uh, so you also have other things like, uh, well, we, we, we did things like uh, we had a plan and then we executed a part of the plan and then we go went on with the whole cycle. But sometimes you want to uh, not uh, interrupt that plan and just do the whole plan. And that is also possible in this, in, in this language. And also very important, we built it here on, 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 on top of the J platform. So one slide about uh, well what we did with BDI plus. So at this moment we have two main directions. We are adding emotions, and perhaps you will say, well, what, what, what the hell is that? So I have one slide uh, to explain that. Uh, and this has an influence on the deliberation cycle. And the other uh, strand that we went was programming normative systems. And normative systems are actually systems that come into in two basic uh, 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 ways. One is that it, if you have a norm and uh, the, the agent should stick to the norm, then it, it, it's called the regimentation. If the agent can't do anything else, sometimes called the Paris or Amsterdam metro system, you can't uh, uh, you can't avoid. Uh, having a ticket because you have always uh, a gate. And uh, also a more liberal system, which is more also more human-like. And uh, there the, the, the agent can violate the norms, but then in that case, we should have uh, some sanctions for the agent uh, because uh, he violated uh, this, these norms. Well. One slide on emotional agents. So combining emotions with rationality, it makes sense. Actually, it's also in the, in the psychological the uh, uh, literature, it became apparent that emotions are not irrational, but they can help rationality. And here we use emotions to provide heuristics in the decision making. So normally we have a lot of rules that apply and here we make choices on, 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 on the basis of emotions, yes? So, um, uh, so at the beginning you had this very nice caution that, that, we're, that you're using these terms as metaphors. Yeah, uh, this is also used as a metaphor. Right, so, so, uh, so I understand that. Uh, so 
so when you use notions of belief, desires, intentions, et cetera, as metaphors, I understand what you're getting at in terms of what it's a metaphor for. Yeah. Uh, with emotions, I'm lost. Yes. Oh, of course. <laughs> Because there is a lot more th uh, to be said about this. Because from the psychological literature, we get that the, these provide for human beings uh, heuristics of what to do. For instance, one very easy uh, uh, heuristic is that if there is a uh, fire outside, then you will all change your behavior. So you apply different rules. <laughs> and that is what also happens here. So in certain emotional states, we uh, apply different uh, rules as in, in normal things. Okay. Okay. And so, so this is actually we use it as a, as, a, as, a, as a technical device. But of course, it's also interesting for people who are interested in cognitive systems and also for AI researchers with uh, virtual characters because they want also believable agents and that sometimes includes emotions. So that we got more or less for free. But uh, this, this functionality is uh, very important. And uh, you, you, you more or less pointed that out. So also something about agent communication, because it is used in the applications that I, uh, I sh I'll show you. So as uh, Alessandro already showed you, uh, these are more or less historically uh, combinations of well-known things that were already around in the 80s. And uh, they are based on speed tag theory and they are standardized. So I have here a list of the kinds of FIPA style communication. Uh, what, what is FIPA? FIPA is this, uh, yeah, it's, it's very strange. It's the Physical Institute for or the, the Foundation for Intelligence. Yeah, foundations of intelligence, physical agent, but it actually also applies for non-physical. It's supposed <laughs> to be the organization providing standards for discussing some uh, conventions or understands for agents and for, for instance, the communication, the protection of agents and also to, to establish a semantics. So yes, and, and, the, the, uh, and, and the semantics can be coined into BDI terms, which is very nice fits into this whole frame. Okay, so now I at uh, how many minutes, five minutes, I show you uh, a, a couple of examples we, we have worked on uh, without going into the code, but uh, these are more or less, uh, 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 well, summaries of, of, of each thesis, I think four thesis in total. And uh, what uh, we did, and using this kind of cognitive programming in a useful way. And actually in, in things like, which are at, 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 uh, at, at first sight totally not cognitive applications like manufacturing. So first I show you this. So this is the agent-based uh, manufacturing and it is uh, applied for uh, for a production grid that means it's a it's a grid of uh, small machines and a, a product goes along a certain uh, path to to get itself made by means of these uh, small machines and this is much more uh, agile and, and flexible than normal production methods and this is based on agent so challenge for a uh, short time to market, customer specific uh, products, small quantities, and grid production is based on a grid of first production platforms called equiplets, and is an agile and scalable uh, software architecture. So here you see in a picture how this works. So you have, a, uh, you have a several of these small machines, equiplets, and then uh, you have uh, product uh, <coughs> steps that, for instance, that the first four are uh, done by equipment A, and then the, the product uh, uh, goes to equipment B, and then three uh, are done, and then, then it goes back to equipment A again, etc. 
So this is an example of a perfect path and equipped with apex these four steps and equipped with these apex three, uh, these three steps and then equipped with apex steps again, etc. So every product is possibly unique. Every product has its production steps. It's a distributed system. And now, very important, a product agent represents the product to be and knows what production steps to do. And an equipment agent represents the equipment, the machi little machine, and knows how to do certain production steps. So you see there will be a close cooperation between products agents and equipment agents to make the product. Uh, well, the information information about yeah, I see, yeah, yeah, just. Uh. So, in this, this would have to be yeah. one case because in order to take off the code, yeah. you have to. Yes, yes, yes. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll restrict uh, to this uh, case. And this is a uh, different, well, <laughs> you have a, a kind of magical. <laughs> 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 this is a different uh, picture. So we, uh, you see here the, 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 the grid, which is uh, 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 consisting of uh, all these, uh, well, a grid of uh, equipments. And then the, the product should uh, choose a path to that. And then, of course, if we have a BDI, BDI agents, these are BDI agents, and uh, they are uh, really communicating by means of FIPA-style uh, uh, communica communication acts. So this product talk, talks with what, what, what kind of, uh, knows what kind of production steps it needs, and then it tries to find an equipment agent that can provide that, and also how to schedule it. So it's a really uh, negotiation between the product agent and the equipment agent. So here you see in a very, well, this is a very uh, um, non-cognitive uh, approach. Uh, and, uh, but uh, you see that inside these agents, can you can make use of BDI uh, and BDI approach? Okay. So the, the, the three minutes and the goal is so it's divided. Um, yeah. The product agent wants the product to be built. He wants yeah. To bring about the exactly. Product. He wants to bring about the built yeah. product. Yeah. Exactly. What does the equipment agent want? The well, the equipment agent it doesn't want to do something, but uh, gets to be asked to do things, because he can do certain things. So he, so he, which just, he just wants to do what he's asked to do. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then, then they match. Okay. But uh, that's, that's the goal. Uh, uh, no. Well, then you can, uh, you can dis disconnect. Okay, so I had another example for you where we uh, also used uh, BDI agents for uh, virtual games. And um, one of these things was, uh, well, one of the hypotheses that we uh, try to show is that if you program uh, virtual characters by means of agents, then you also know by logging what kind of rules have been used, then you can also uh, provide explanations why, uh, why uh, uh, certain characters did what they did. And that is very important for trainees that uh, they know what something happens in the, in the game and what was the reason of the, the virtual character to do something. And it could provide this because of the BDI kind of uh, rules that were applied. Well, I guess that's good. You realize the example, concrete example about that. Something like okay. Is it, is it, is it Okay. So we'll move to yeah, move the, the practical section. So now we see. 
So um, my job is to talk about um, agent speak um, and two languages I'm going to show you. Uh, one is called JSON. This is the, uh, the de facto standard. And the other one is um, my language, which is called Astra. So I have a few slides, but I'll try to get down to the code as quick as I can. Um, so I'm going to skip this, but go on to basically agent speak is a, an event-driven agent programming language. So um, <coughs> of the various styles of programming language that exist, Agent speak uses events to drive behavior. Um, Kuhn's language goal is not an event-driven language. It's an alternative style of agent programming language. And that's one of the things you have to see from within the community. Unlike object-oriented programming, we don't have a single simple model. We have a very high-level model that we all uh, we find consistent, but the low-level detail can be very different from, la from, from language to language. So we have kind of families of languages, languages that are related. <coughs> in agent speak, beliefs represent the state. Goals are the desired future state, but they're implicit. We don't uh, actually try to check that they're achieved. We say that we want to achieve a state, but we just we recognize achievement by performing a plan and are completing a plan. Goals, intentions then are the plans that we, as we select to achieve goals. The idea is we have some state, we have a goal, we select a plan to achieve a goal, we execute the plan, and as a result of executing the plan, if it's successful, we've achieved the goal. If it's unsuccessful, we fail to achieve our goal. That's the basic model that underpins it. Um, I like to think of these things in a more prosaic way. We use a lot of complex terms. We use a lot of beliefs, desires, and you know, mental states and this sort of terminology. So I want to say agent speak is, is just an event-driven language at the end of the day. Okay? Different types of events are generated and added to an event queue. And there are a set of handlers that essentially process those events one at a time. Each handler does, t when we process an event, two things happen. Firstly, we check which handlers are relevant to the plan, or sorry, to the event. And secondly, what we do is we then check something we call a context to see whether it can be used. So we have two steps in our handling process. One, we get handlers that are relevant. And two, then we check for a handler that can, is applicable. When we find a handler that can be used to handle an event, we execute, we, 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 we take that associated plan and we execute it. Okay. In terms of the way we talk about these things, the event handlers are called plan rules. The program state is modeled as beliefs that are atomic um, predicate formulae. The events are also modeled in the same way, and as are goals. An execution of plans is achieved through the creation and manipulation of these things we call intentions. Intentions are just essentially program stacks. Intentions execute plans, and plans are procedural blocks of code that are handled in exactly the same way any procedural programming language handles the execution of procedural code. Okay. Events may be state-based, which is one of the, the novel things about um, agent speak, uh, in that events can be generated in, in response to changes in state. Events can also be generated in response to changes or in response to the adoption or declaring of goals. So there are two ways, basic ways that events get generated. Also, events can be related to messages. So to explain this, I've got an example. It's a very simple example. It's Hello World printed out three times, but hopefully it's uh, going to be enough, complex enough to show you some of the features. So this is a, an agent program in agent speak. This is our belief. So this is an initial belief of the agent, which is something that says that it is a, a belief which is called the count, and the count is three. Beliefs are state just like fields are state within object-oriented programming. So if I was to take that idea and say, this looks very different to us, but if I was to say, oops, where's my slide? 
This is the one I want to show. So, you know, beliefs, beliefs are state, but really the, they can be seen as being very much similar to one another. So, we can look on the left hand side, we have Java, we have things like primitives, fields that are declared. In logic, you can represent those same ideas using simple things like uh, balance zero. It's the same as having a field called balance, which is initialized to the value zero. So, there's a lot of relationships you can represent arrays within logic using uh, things called lists. You can represent data classes. In this sort of way, this might be functional terms or predicates. You can represent maps. You can represent sets. Most of the concepts, most of the data structures that you have within traditional software engineering, there are equivalents in logic programming okay, and within agent programming languages. Okay. I suppose one of the big differences is you lose some of the encapsulation. Some of the, the methods, the behavior associated with a person, for example, gets lost. We're going back to more of a, a structured programming perspective in that we're representing the information separately from the behavior in terms of the modeling of the state. But I mean, I, I have, in the way I've done Astra, I've tried to come around at that from a different perspective as well. So the second thing then is we have goals. Goals look a lot like um, beliefs. They have an exclamation mark before them to say this is a goal, not a belief. And goals drive behavior. So in this program, I have an initial state that consists of two things, a belief and a goal. Okay, and they're added at the start when you, when you launch the program. Over here we have an example of plan rules, and each one of the, the other four things are other examples of plan rules. Plan rules consist of a bunch of things. There is a, what we call a triggering condition, which basically says this is the type of event this, this plan rule will handle. You can see that we have one to handle an init, an init event, we have two to handle a hello event, and the plus before relates to the addition of what's called the belief addition event or the goal addition event. So when we add a belief or we declare a goal, we get an event that corresponds to the addition of, the represents the addition of the belief or the declaration of the goal. When we drop a belief, we get an event to correspond to the dropping of the belief as well. Okay. The second part, which is a novelty of agent speak, is the idea of a context. And this is essentially an assertion, it's a guard, that tells you the conditions under which this rule should be used to process this event. Okay? So it's possible in this respect to think of this as being a little bit like a method, it's already been said. The signature of the method is the event, or the triggering event. The context means that you can have multiple implementations for the same method signature, and you choose dynamically, at the point at which you uh, handle the event, which one of those method implementations you choose, which one of those method implementations method implementations you're going to execute. So it's got this late binding, this late binding of events to behavior. So because we have an event queue, we're going to keep adding events to the event queue, and these events are going to be processed sequentially. So it might be that when you adopt a goal, you don't achieve the goal until later on because you have to wait until the event to achieve the goal is processed. So you get this idea that you might have delayed execution. Now this might seem as a bad thing, but one of the benefits of this is that you're able to essentially uh, interleave multiple intentions that are executing concurrently. This part then is the plan body, and it's just a set of statements. This is what we call a primitive action. This is a sub goal, and as you can see, this sub goal would result in the adoption of another goal adoption event, which would then give you a recursive sort of behavior here. So you're going to start off with, in this program, we start off with count as three. We call out init goal init. That's going to have a, um, an init goal. The ad an uh, event that we've added the goal in it, which will be triggered by this. The context here is true, so that it, uh, it always uh, gets fired. That's going to call a sub goal hello. And hello has two different rules. The first rule says that the count is n. So if we have a belief, if our state includes this, then we choose this rule and we assess them in the order defined in the program. If this rule, if this context is not true, we can fall back to this rule. Okay, so here we have a state, so n, gets, n is a variable that gets assigned a value 3. We use this rule to handle it, and we call, the, we adopt the sub goal hello 3, which brings us over to here. n has the value 3, 3 is greater than 0. We print out hello world, recursively call hello world minus 1 for 2. n is 2, we print out hello world, recursively call hello world for n equals 1. We print out hello world, recursively call hello world for n equals 0. And then there's no rules that apply. Now, 
technically what would happen in agent speak is that at that point the, the plan or the intention would fail. Okay? What I really needed to do in this, and I, I didn't remember to do it until the end, is I should add one extra rule at the bottom that says hello plus exclamation mark hello n, where the context is true, to say that if we get past this rule, we've got a sort of a catch-all rule at the end that says do nothing or print out hello world one last time, and then don't make the recursive call so that we can basically then undo the recursion and get back to the completion of the event. Yes? Yes. So the first one defined yes. Will yes. So the first one in, it's in rule order defined within the program. So the way you write the program determines the order. So if I was to swap the order of those two rules, then that second rule, that rule down here, would never fire, because this rule would have the context would always be true, and it would always o it would always be selected over the other rule. Yes. It means additions. So you have events for the addition of a goal or the addition of a state and events for the removal of state. So what's happening here is that I've declared a goal, so I get an event plus exclamation mark in it, which then is handled. We don't actually have an event that is the goal. We have an event that is the event that a goal has been declared or an event that the goal has been dropped. And the same way we have the event that a state has been added or the event that the state has been dropped. Yes? When a goal matches the header of a rule, mm -hmm. It consumes the event, yes. Yeah. So, I suppose I've kind of already said this, but where are the events? The events are generated by all of these points here. So, initially, the initial state generates two events, plus count three and plus init. That first event, yes? You can over. So, here we have two rules that handle the same event. That's not a problem. That's in, that's in fact the, the one of the benefits of this style of programming. It's a it's a positive thing because you can then you can ten, you contextually choose which method to implement essentially based upon the current state of your agent or the current state of your object. So there's a few other things you can add and remove beliefs within within the program, and you can uh, have test goals which allow you to check does a state occur. So you can say perform two or three steps in a plan, and then check did I get the state I expected. If I didn't, I can fail. If I did, then I can keep on going. So it allows you to have checkpoints within your program that you can say, have I done, has th have things gone as I expect them to do? Now, the way that failure is handled depends upon the language. Um, I'm not the 100% expert on JSON, but if I remember correctly, JSON failure is that you get a, a minus goal. Um, I take a different, I have a, tri I have a try recover type statement in Astra, so it's, it's not consistent across Astra, across Astra and JSON, but it's is that they both have a way of handling failure of an event, of a failure, failure within a plan. So the final bit of this is then the intentions. The intentions are just program stacks. Okay? So whenever you, whenever you um, handle an event, you, you select your plan rule, you essentially push that plan onto a program stack, and you execute it in just the same way any programming language would execute procedural code. Whenever you um, get a sub-goal, you essentially you post your event and you suspend the intention. You then wait until that event is handled, and when the event is handled, the rule you select in the sub for the sub goal for the event gets appended or added onto the stack, like and it's treated in the same way that a method call is done. So your sub goal is like a method call, and then when you handle that method call later on, you essentially push onto the intention stack the next step of the, the next plan or the sub plan to achieve the sub-goal. And you can keep doing that and you can produce stack traces just like you can produce in any language. And it would be based upon, the top level would typically be a reaction to a change in the environment, so one where the, the, pre the, the event relates to a belief update, and then the rest of them would typically relate to goal updates. So, <clears throat> so the interpreter cycle for agent speak is very simple. You initialize your mental state, so you load the program. You then have a perception phase where you essentially update your beliefs. Um, you then have an event handling phase where you select one and uh, handle one event, and you select which you then re use to re refine your commitments, your, your intentions, and then you select and execute one statement from an, from an intention. 
So you handle one, each iteration, you handle one event, causing a new intention to be adopted or causing an int existing intention to be refined, and you process one statement from one intention. And you keep doing that as fast as you can. As fast as you can. So the difference, so in my view, the sort of the relationship to mainstream concepts, an agent is a lot like a process in my view. And for agent speak, intentions are a lot like threads. Now it's a little different with Kuhn's work where he doesn't have the multi-threading aspect. Okay. No? I'll stop. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Smack my hand. <laughs> Didn't do that. <laughs> um, so the other thing, so agent, in agent speak, agents like processes, intentions are like threads. Um, plans are like methods, goals are like method calls, beliefs are like fields, and goal achievement interleaved. Okay? So essentially it's like method, uh, uh, essentially it's where different intentions are executed in parallel versus method invocation where it's direct and immediate invocation of the method based upon the message, based upon the method call. So the unique selling points in my view for agent speak are firstly you've got this delayed binding of behavior. Okay? So you essentially say, okay, perform this sub goal or invoke this method, if you like, wait until you get to the point where you handle that, and at that point, you can check the state to see which one of the implementations should I use to handle this particular um, goal. So you can choose from among different competing methods. You also have this idea that there's a state-driven behavior aspect, and this comes back to the idea that as state changes, you get events. You can handle those events the same way you handle goal events, and you, so you can essentially fire different types of behavior, trigger different types of behavior. So you've got something equivalent to like a trigger in SQL. You change the state, you can have a side effect, you can have a side effect rule that triggers, that causes some other behavior to take place. So the clock changes, the clock ticks, you get a new time, you can then respond by doing something because you now have, you're now at a new point in time, for example. Yes? So uh, don't you have all the same interleaving hazards Acting on beliefs that are no longer true. In other words, you have a plan, you have to authenticate two plans mm -hmm. executed in parallel. Yeah. Um, uh, one of them, based on a particular belief, you know, proceeds to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, but then while it's happening, the belief is changed by the other plan. Mm -hmm. So it's now acting on incorrect knowledge. Uh, based on having been triggered by a belief that's no longer true, the one that's been out from under it. So, so there's low level atomicity in terms of the, the statement level. Okay, you get that level, that below the level of a statement. So each individual step in the plan is atomic. That's the first thing. But yes, you do get that problem. So we do have different ways of dealing with that. Some, some one way is to use an atomic plan. So essentially, you get something equivalent to an, a, a, a message handler in an actor that you say, this is atomic, and only do this and ignore everything else. Uh, I, I have a slightly different way that I use synchronized. I use locks within my code, so I can sort of identify critical regions. But... I suppose the difference between the two things is that the, the multi-threading is a little bit fairer within the agent level because you're executing one statement at a time. So you have an interleaving, whereas you don't have the idea that you don't know when. It's not. It's determinist or more deterministic in terms of you, you, know, you know when it's going to release control. It's going to release control after one statement. Um, yes. So, so uh, Because um, it's to do with event processing in agent speak. So you have essentially a stream of events coming in, and you have to process them in a, in a you typically process them in a FIFO way. 
So you're waiting for you, when you, when you execute when you adopt your subgoal, you're waiting for the the subgoal is a, event is added to the end of the event stream. So you're waiting for any existing events to be processed before you get to that. Now I know that you can do optimizations. That's exactly the difference with my language. Yeah. I don't have that at all. So they need to have written all the plan yeah. nice languages. You need to handle those types of issues yeah. because they introduce delayed action. In my language, that's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's, a, it's, not a, it's a drawback of this style of programming. So, how are we doing on time? Uh, yes, the trust. I should try and write one program maybe. So, I, I'll just jump to one thing very quickly and I'll be done in three minutes. Yeah? Or we can, I can, I can maybe, I want, I want to show one, one program. So, I'm going to skip my slides. We really have run out of time. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to let you to show the tower stuff. So, I'm going to try and show one. one I, I was going to hopefully show Jason and um, uh, my language. I'm going to show my language because I'm going to be selfish. Um, so Jason looks a lot like Agent Speak, okay? And it, it's the it's a reference model. It's a very very good model, and it's got lots of advanced features that have been built on top of the basic Agent Speak model. This is my language. It's called Astra. Um, <coughs> I suppose what I've tried to do is reflect upon some of the evolutions since Agent Speak, since Agent Speak was invented and try to provide some, something that's a little bit more in touch with or easier to use from a developer's perspective. So I've adopted some syntax to make it look more familiar so it's less scary. And my feedback has been whenever I've show, used this with uh, students has been that it, that it is actually a benefit. They understand it um, more readily. Uh, I've had things like um, local variables. So Basically, agent speak within procedural code didn't have local state. So essentially, you had to use global state to deal with local state. And you can imagine the problems of dealing with global state to deal with synchronization. And you know, it was making it worse. So, and I've also uh, typically um, objects are kept out of the, there's a, a very distinct separation between the, the agent level and the underlying object level. So I've tried to bring the objects into the agent level so you can have relationships or predicates that relate to objects that are Java objects that you're using. So th this example that I've got here is a very simple implementation of a, an agent-based web server. Uh, I'm using Netty for the asynchronous I.O. support. And basically what I've done is I've written, there were this is the whole implementation here. There's five classes I've written for it. Three of them, the, the web server and the handler, or two of them, the web server and the handler are just something I grabbed from the web. And then there's a, a folder handler to allow you to have just standard folders. And a, the agent handler is the bit that links Netty to the agent layer. And they have this thing called a module, which is my HTTP thing, which uh, allows me to do things with the uh, events. So what happens here is that the, the web server receives a HTTP request. It gets passed that. It, it's using a U I need to show one last thing. So it's using a, a sort of standard, sort of modern standard web services type, well, web-based URL. So you've got a URL with a host and a port some sort of application context and an agent name, and then some other things. So I can I map that URL onto an agent, and I generate a goal relating to the, uh, the request. So my goal comes in. I've got a goal here, which is a post request. Here's the, uh, the Netty components that I'm going to have to deal with, the channel hand handler context and the request. I've got a list of arguments, and I have, uh, which are the anything that comes after the name of the agent in the URL. And because it's a post, I've got a list of fields, which is the posted data. I uh, basically can involve a just a simple login. So I've got essentially, I invoke a goal to validate the user. I get back a response, which is not specified yet. And then I send, I convert that response, which is written in um, logic into a JSON object, which is then returned. So on the, the client side, I uh, have standard HTML and JavaScript and so on. Okay. So <coughs> I might be able to send this or send something which just has curly bracket result. In colon in session, close curly bracket in JSON. So this is a way that I've managed to really, really simply take the, the idea of something like um, something like a, a web server component, and I've integrated it directly into an agent using some of the features like the, 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 the ability to represent objects. And I can basically provide a, a very easy way for you to build 
more complex system with that. So to run it, I'll try and show you what happens. running. I need a web browser for my email server on. Uh, so there's, I'm serving a standard, a standard uh, HTML page. I'll basically allow myself to, I've made one user. So I'm going to basically type in, so I've got that. What I have behind the scenes is I've got a, a, an Ajax request that is sent to the web server with uh, my username and password, and it's going to send back a response that will t confirm or deny me access. So what's going to happen is that I'm going to send that a JSON. It's going to be converted into a goal, which will be a validate goal with a post. I'm going to be able to extract the username and password from the, uh, the data, and then call my uh, validate user um, rule, event goal, which basically just says, Query uh, a, a belief called a registration belief, which has a list of registered users. Um, check if the password matches. If it does, I create a HTTP session, so I authorize them. They've got a, essentially a server-side session ID. And then <coughs> send back a response saying, yes, you have access. Uh, otherwise, send back failed or send back in the case of a failure. So in the case that uh, this query, there is no user with username U, so that query will fail. I then recover by saying fail, no such user. So if I try my thing, yeah, I'm going to let you go. Can you, can you work through this? Draw our attention. Yeah. Yeah. Very nicely. Yeah. Um, can I ask yeah, useful. Yeah. Can you uh, draw, our, uh, draw our attention to what it is about this example that creates different programming experience than the way you would have written this example in the traditional way? I think that example in its own, it's, it's very difficult to produce a compelling example from in the time that we have. So that's the first thing I have to say. I, I, it's very difficult to sort of sell you something uh, because these things are built for distributed systems. Yeah, they're not really built for single examples like this. What, what, what I would say is that in that, in that state there, you can essentially, when you get your request in, you can then contact other agents. So in the same way that you can use this in the actor model, pass messages. But if I was to think of this from the perspective of web-based systems, often if you want to do things on the server side, you need things like cron jobs to essentially provide the proactive behavior on the server. So you need to invoke scripts on the server side to push out events, maybe to check for if emails need to be sent or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, let me try to explain it one more time to you guys in a slightly different way. Um, so, uh, I worked on the language that Jean-Jules uh, discussed a while back, and then I continued and I thought, okay, we need to simplify the agent-oriented paradigm a bit, get back to its core, and that's the difference that I take with at least your approach, I guess. I take a much more declarative point of view. We're at the more abstract uh, level of uh, abstraction in programming here, what we're trying to do, that's how I view things. Um, and I think we need to focus on the core concepts of this programming paradigm, uh, because if we are trying to learn a new programming paradigm and think about it in a simplified way, I think it will be more effective. Anyway, I'll try and show you a little bit. Uh, I'll also take a way more AI perspective than perhaps in the previous talks because I think what we need to do and where we're coming from is look at how we can provide programmers with easier access to all kinds of sof sophisticated IA, IA uh, techniques. So I guess you already have had a sense of that we uh, have done a lot of work on reasoning techniques and getting that into our programs. Uh, Rem showed that a little bit already. Uh, I, and what should have been uh, stuck already, I guess, is that these languages are really about decision-making. We're aiming at the decision-making level, 
Uh, so for example, an example that I won't be able to show you anymore due to time, I guess, but in case, in case you're interested, uh, we do gaming a lot with students. We used to do Java. What they end up with is writing low-level stuff, how to shoot, how to aim, that kind of, of methods. But I want them to think about teams of bots and strategies and how to uh, implement the decision-making for these bots. So that's where these languages come in. Now, end of the day, I would like to make a few more steps and include planning, learning techniques. I already did that to some extent in the language that I'm working on. Um, so that also becomes available in a more easy uh, way to uh, developers. Now, I think there's a whole story to, to tell there about those developers. But in any case, if we are going to have AI system, complex systems, we need to make the life of our AI engineers a little bit more easy than that's the case right now. You can debate about the routes, obviously. I take a programming language perspective um, as one option that we should definitely try. And then the next thing uh, that I start from is the cognitive technology that Jean Gilles also was talking about. Well, we all have been talking about and then the aim is to design a high-level AI programming language that actually allows us to make these autonomous decision systems. So directly start at a different level where particular AI algorithms can act as building blocks in that language. So that's a quite an ambition, but something that we've been working on. So this is the simp simplest view that you can have on what we're doing. We're always connecting to some external environment a robot, a game, these are actual examples that we've been working on a lot. Um, and then we want to have a cognitive agent on top of that to control what happens on the robot or in the game, so units in the games. So what we see, and there's yeah, events are everywhere, we take them in, we process them, and we decide on the next action to take. And in my approach, that's actually, actually what happens. It's deciding on the next thing to do. So it's really situation-based. Not so much plan-based as situation-based. In a situation, you need to think about the decision to take. Now, key concepts that we've already seen, like beliefs and goals, are also key elements, core elements in the language. My language is rule-based as well. I'll just show you where... Um, what it looks like in a moment. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a feel of the concepts that uh, are often used in our community to talk about the concepts uh, in, a, in the programming par paradigm that we, we're building. So it's a lot about interaction, goal-directedness, rationality is a thing. Uh, that's a key topic in AI. How can we make sure that the decision-making is rational? And on this side, you see a lot more of the environment side stuff and also the um, multi-agent uh, concepts that I'm not going to talk a lot about right now because I want to show you the basic stuff that we have been looking at. So to say what we are aiming at, or at least I'm aiming at, is that we are trying to program with cognitive states. Uh, these cognitive states relate directly to the type of decision making that we do all the day. That's the human uh, metaphor that you came up with already. Uh, we make decisions based on what we want and what we believe, and that's where the reasoning part automatically comes in. We need to be able to reason, and reasoning technologies, knowledge representation technologies, are being used for that uh, purpose. Of course, I have also my slide with a cycle. What happens? Basically, it's uh, pretty much of uh, a one-to-one -one map on what you see here. There's an environment that's going to be percept or event information that comes in. You need to process that. It's not like you simply dump that in your uh, database of beliefs. You need to think about what you see or what you hear from other agents. You decide, you perform the action, and you update your cognitive state. Just to give you a little bit more of a feel of what is under the hood then, and where you can find that stuff is all uh, available on GitHub, that what we are working on. And there's two parts of the story here, actually. You can find a lot on this part on the ISOP related to environments, because we always need to write these connectors. 
uh, how to connect an agent to an environment. So that's a bit of the work that you can find here. And then a lot of the other components you can find on GoalHub um, where uh, we include stuff for the reasoning that we build on top of. We have runtime and obviously we have um, tooling of like Eclipse for debugging, etc. Now here's the toy example just to give you a little bit of feel for the program. It's going to be a very um, classic AI planning example but now translated to agents in a more dynamic setting. I'll show you in a moment uh, the, the uh, actual program. So we have blocks, we need to go from one state to the other. There's some rules there that are typically in, sta in, uh, in play here. Uh, certain blocks are in position, like this block is already on the table, so that's fine. Constructive moves are moves where you put blocks in position, so these are key concepts that you want to translate into your program. And I highlight those here because you can see those in a minute in the program itself. So here's then where we start with the basic layer. There's the knowledge representation stuff here. So the how to represent the basic facts. Yeah, how do we represent them? We use Prolog in this example. We could use other technologies. That's not really the point, but we need to build on top of some knowledge representation language. So we have basic predicates like there's a block on top of another block and we can define stuff in Prolog. If you know the language, then you'll be able to follow. Otherwise, just take in the intuitive concept uh, here. To reason about the domain and what we want to achieve, we want to build stacks or towers. Well, stacks in the sense of we introduce those concepts. We need to know when we can put some, some block on top of another block. So that's where we introduce rules for when a block is clear, for example. And the basic assumption is that the table is always clear. Now then, it becomes really easy what you do. Uh, we need to represent an initial state. Those would be the beliefs of the agent. So you get a set of basic facts. You can see A is on top of B, so you get that fact there, etc. We had some rules that we wanted to use to reason about these states. Obviously essential also for the decision making that comes in later. And that's um, that we also need to put somewhere in the, in the program. Going to not really go into the discussion here about why it's going to be a separate database. But there is going to be a database of knowledge, of static stuff, things that don't change. And we can use that in combination with our beliefs. But also in combination with our goals. So I don't want to only be able to reason that there's a stack in a particular state that I am at in, but I also want to check whether there is a particular tower that I want. For example, A on top of E on top of B is a, is a tower I want to have. If I combine that with these knowledge rules, I can actually reason about it. So that's the key reason. A goal. Pretty much the same stuff, not so much different. There is a tiny little detail here, but I'm skipping that for now just because of time. But you represent your goals for your agent as well to be able to reason about where you want to be. So you get a cognitive state that consists of these components, and then we can actually do stuff. So we need actions, obviously. Uh, these need to be specified. I'm skipping the details here again. But obviously, if we move A on top of D, we get a change state, and you need to process that. So that's where the agent will actually change and update its state. Now, so the basic thing just for you guys, I'm assuming language designers here, um, is that we're working on top of a layer, in a layered language, in, in fact. Uh, so we have whatever knowledge representation language that you have, and we need to put our agent language on top of that. It embeds the specific stuff from the knowledge representation language, and we put operators ar around those to say, okay, inspect my beliefs or inspect my goals. And that's basic um, 
these are the basic rules that you get. So it's a rule-based language, as I, as I was saying before. And you check your basic conditions here. If I want something, I have a particular goal, then I will do something. That's how the language works. You get a set of these rules. And these sets make up modules, which you can combine in a modular fashion again. So that's the basic stuff to build um, a decision-making agent, a cognitive agent here. And I just wanted to show you a little bit what it looks like in real life. So here we have Eclipse. You see all kinds of module files here. This is the main module file that where the decision making on what to do is hidden. This is a very simple example because we're playing with blocks, right? So if I want to hold something, then I need to pick up something. Basic logic there. That's the abstraction that we're looking for. And let me just show you what, what, what happens here. So we swap to a debugging uh, view now. You see here on one screen um, the environment being started. It's just a graphical user interface here, obviously. As a simple example, I need to put some blocks in there to get things going. And then um, start things here. And I'll just take a few steps so you can single step this code. So we get into this module. We check whether we want to hold anything. Well, right now we have a view here on the beliefs and the goals, but we don't want to hold anything that's easy reasoning. And the reasoning engine will do that for us, obviously. So we don't get to do anything here. We don't hold anything and we continue. We'll also check whether we can apply an action, again, using basic uh, reasoning of the underlying language. In this case, we can do the action, so we will do nil, which is actually nothing. So not so interesting yet. And then we move on to a, another module that will process events. So we need to look at all the stuff that we get in now. We did something. Let's look at the environment again. What kind of stuff comes out of that? No. Yeah. So let's just assume that we have done our work rightly and we see what happens there. It's a reactive language in the sense that we can play with the thing and, oops, okay, so it's going to want to put something on F now. I'm going to change it and it's immediately reasoning that something else should happen. So here... Again, it will respond immediately. Of course, I could be a little bit more helpful, and then it would more easily finish things. Uh, you see here what happens. You don't see right now how the state is changing, uh, but now it's finished and things terminate. And we could inspect, for example, still what is believed to be the case, etc. What kind of percepts it got, etc., etc. Okay. So this gives a little bit of a sense of. Um, what the language is doing. And I hope you also get a feel that it's a much more declarative perspective than uh, other languages. Now, just to not take too much more time, um, we had a serious gaming um, example. This is comp uh, so I, I was asked to show you a bit more uh, mature applications as well. Obviously, that's gonna, going to be a challenge, but we had um, we have worked with a um, company called Tigon, and the students actually created virtual agents that um, replaced human players of this game. So this is an urban city planning game. In that game, you're asked to redesign a particular area of a city. Think about it. You have different roles. You have mayors, etc. You have a real realistic uh, interface that you can use and you need to negotiate. So one of the questions the company had was, can you actually build an agent, a cognitive agent that does the decision making that a human would no normally do and have that play 
instead of the human. Now, you see here a few things will happen. You need to, to think about the buildings that you build, where to put those things, and um, then negotiate with other places. Obviously, the negotiation is not very visible right now, but under the hood, that's the type of thing that's going on. I'm not sure if in this video we also get to see the agent code. Now, this is the fun thing that I'm working on right now. I'm not uh, just to close off them perhaps with this one. So actually, I think one of the key challenges that we have back in AI uh, is to interact with robots. That's also where we want to use this cognitive agent as a decision engine to make the decisions about how to interact with humans. We're actually doing that right now in a startup. So uh, that's a lot of fun. I want to close on that note, I guess to uh, let you know that we're actually applying this stuff. Okay, thanks. We have an automated testing uh, type of thing that you can use and help to build uh, this stuff. But it's a... Uh yeah, there's a PhD of me working on those types of topics right now to facilitate the developer. Yeah. Like this? Yeah. Mm -hmm.